listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. The shows on this network all have a common goal, providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. The PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening. Hi, welcome back to the Story By Podcast. Thanks for stopping by. Today's episode was probably inspired by an experiment in writing like another author. I've known a lot of writers who, when starting out intentionally or not, imitate authors whose work they enjoy or admire. When I took one of those doofy online writing sample analyses, I was informed that my style most closely resembled Stephen King's. Given that I've survived on a steady diet of King material for decades, that wasn't exactly a surprise. But there's another author whose work I probably admire almost as much, particularly his way with naturalistic dialogue, and that's Elmore Leonard. You've probably heard of Leonard's fiction, even if you don't recognize his name. The movies Get Shorty, 310 to Yuma, and Out of Sight are adaptations of his work and Tarantino's Jackie Brown is based on Leonard's novel Rum Punch. I think Mercy Killing was, unintentionally or not, meant to be sort of an Elmore Leonard-esque story. I'll leave it up to you whether I even got close. Mercy Killing An RN dressed in pastels and floral, like a resort employee, knocked on the doorframe of Suite 218 and leaned her head in the open doorway. Mrs. Klein, you have a visitor. Mrs. Klein, seated in a chair near the patio door, replied with a sigh, a wave of her hand, and, Send him in. The nurse gave the man beside her a smile that suggested he was in for a rough time. He returned a smile that made the nurse wish he wasn't wearing a Roman collar. Good luck, father, she said, and hurried away to gossip with the other staff about the priest who looked like a movie star. The priest in question leaned in the door and said, Good morning, Mrs. Klein. How are we this morning? I've got cancer, I'm dying, and I'm an atheist. I don't know how you're doing. She continued to stare out the patio at the other residents of the Golden Sunset Retirement Village who wandered about in the courtyard, chatting, playing chess, and trying to remember who they were. May I come in? Mrs. Klein shrugged her bony shoulders, and the young priest stepped into the suite. He approached her quietly until he stood beside her. He looked at Mrs. Klein, who sat curled in the chair, her lower body draped with a knitted afghan, A blue and purple tie-dyed kerchief covered her naked skull. The dye color matched the bags under her eyes. May I take a seat? Another shrug. He sat in the chair beside her, which afforded him a view of the residence outside, the tiny woman in the other seat, and the entrance to her room. He watched the seniors outside as he spoke. I'm Father Michael Shea. The tiny woman shrugged again, still avoiding eye contact. I suppose Charles sent you. Your son did make a request that someone from the local parish visit you. He thinks I'm ready to change my heathen ways. Charles wants to make sure that you meet God in a state of grace. She shook her head. See the two old farts at the table out there? The ones playing chess? Shay nodded. The bald guy with the big nose and hairy ears is Henry Klingerman. He plays chess with Louie. The guy with the bad rug is Louis Spinoza. Every day. Henry beats him every time. 
Shay nodded again. Louis can't play chess to save his life, but he keeps it up to have something to do. It passes the time, Shay said. He has companionship. Mrs. Klein snorted. I think I'd rather sit by myself and rot than let Klingerman beat me at anything. The priest and the old woman sat silently for a while. So you're supposed to help me find Jesus? In a manner of speaking, Mrs. Klein looked at Shay for the first time. You're not a priest, are you? Shay raised an eyebrow. That's cute, Mrs. Klein said. You practice it in the mirror? Shay smiled. What gave me away? You're too cute to be a priest. You look like a young Burt Lancaster with that hair and those teeth. You're built like an acrobat. In addition, you've been here for five minutes and haven't tried to console me or turn me to God. Shea smiled wider, giving her all 1,000 watts. That's not really what did it. Mrs. Klein shook her head. It was the hands. Shea looked at his hands. You've got calluses. I knew a priest in El Salvador whose hands were so rough you could sand wood with them. People who spread the word of God with the sweat of their brow often have calloused hands. Not along the edges like that. And you've got scars on your knuckles. What is it? Taekwondo? Karate? Something where you show off breaking boards and bricks? He snorted. Mrs. Klein sighed, said, So you're here to kill me? Shay raised an eyebrow again. Stop that. It doesn't suit you. And I refuse to be killed by a man who looks ridiculous. Shay sighed, then looked around the room. He saw no decorations on the walls, no knickknacks scattered around, nothing particularly homey anywhere in the room. A pair of framed photographs provided a backdrop for the collection of pill bottles on the bedside table. A Robert B. Parker paperback novel stood tented alongside the photographs. The room itself was painted with soothing colors, hung with lacy curtains, and designed to look as much as possible like a home instead of a room in a care facility. You don't like it here? Mrs. Klein turned to watch Spinoza and Klingerman again. Would you? I've lived in worse places. After a moment, he added, but I suppose a designer prison cell is still a prison cell. They sat for a while, then Shea broke the silence with, How long did they give you? Six months, maybe a year, if I keep taking the drugs and letting them microwave me some more. She touched the kerchief that covered her head. I figure buying an extra six months isn't worth all the puking and exhaustion. Plus, this place is expensive. All I'm doing is depleting Charles's inheritance. Shay nodded. Wouldn't be the first time I've been hired for that reason. I suppose not. Shay rose and walked over to the bedside table. He picked up the book, realized he'd actually read it, and put it down. He picked up the pictures. This is your son Charles and his wife? Charlene. They call each other Charlie. Isn't that precious? The other one is my husband, Rudy. Rudy was a deputy sheriff, Mrs. Klein added. Died ten years ago. You still miss him? Sometimes, when it rains. Shay waited. On our first date, we went for a hike in a cemetery of all places. Mrs. Klein looked down at her bony lap. Rudy was one of those Civil War buffs. He was always checking out local cemeteries, looking for stones of soldiers from the war. He'd do rubbings and collect them in his binder. Anyway, we were out in the cemetery, and it started to rain really hard. So we ducked under the front of this mausoleum to keep dry. It rained for hours and we were clear on the opposite side of the cemetery from his car. We were huddled up, sitting on this kind of stone bench, and we got to talking. 
I found out that he was involved in the Civil War reenactors group. You know, the guys that get dressed up and fight the battle of Hoochie Coochie Creek or some such. Shea smiled, watching Mrs. Klein drift back to that rainy day. I told him I thought my great, great something or other had actually fought at that battle, and his eyes lit up like a kid in a candy store. Mrs. Klein paused and looked up at Shea. Do they still have candy stores anymore? Just a place where you can go in and buy candy by the piece? Shea shrugged. Some malls have them, I guess. Mrs. Klein snorted. Malls. After a moment, she said, Where was I? I think you were about to fall in love with your husband. She smiled at him and said, You're a smart ass. Shea nodded. Anyway, he was talking and got all excited about my great, great whatever, and he kept yapping, and I just up and kissed him. You trying to shut him up? A sly grin slid across Mrs. Klein's face. Maybe, but it was worth it. He was a great kisser. Shea looked at the picture of the stern man with broad shoulders, an Old West mustache, and a leathery face. He tried to imagine this guy and the birdie little woman in the armchair making out in a cemetery in a downpour. He make you happy? Almost fifty years. All the happiness only produced one child? Mrs. Klein nodded. When I was a girl, I had an accident horseback riding. I got thrown and I broke my leg and pelvis. Supposedly, that made it hard for me to stay pregnant. One hand shifted absently over her lower abdomen. I know birthing Charles was about the hardest thing I'd ever done. Hours and hours in labor. Then they finally decided to do a C-section. Shay walked back toward his chair, sat and placed a hand on hers. I'm sorry. It's okay. It was almost forty years ago. Reflexively, her hand folded around his. Shea was amazed by the softness of her hand and the weakness of her grip. You talk to all your... Mrs. Klein paused, searching for a word. What do you call them? Victims? I usually think of them as targets. You talk to all your targets like this? He shook his head. Just taking pity on an old woman? Shea shook his head again. I've been watching you for a while, trying to learn your routine. My routine consists of getting up, sitting here, going to bed, some pills, a little puking, and a few other unpleasantries, and my day is complete. That inactivity will kill you as surely as I could. Mrs. Klein shrugged. So I'm practically dead already. Makes your job easier. Eh, but why was I hired? To kill me, of course. Sure, but why? Your son's a lawyer. His wife's a lawyer. They have no dependents. Well, except for a pair of expensive show dogs. They're loaded with money, but they pinch pennies tight enough to make Lincoln scream like a girl. Shea glanced down at their hands. You're in good financial shape, but after all is said and done, they're going to inherit chump change. Add in what it costs to hire me, and it's not worth the investment. I don't exactly come cheap. Mrs. Klein gave him a fading smile. That's good. I'd hate to be killed by a cheap thug. Shea cocked his head and scrutinized her face. She avoided his eyes. You hired me he said after a moment. Or you found someone to hire me. She withdrew her hand from his. Why do you think that? Because you're dying. Because it hurts, and you want it over. Not prolonged with drugs and radiation. Besides, you knew immediately what I was. Nice ladies like yourself, even ones married to cops, don't generally jump to that sort of conclusion. A tear slid away from her eye. 
I'm tired and I'm old and I've just had enough. But you don't want to do it yourself. You said you're an atheist, so hell's not a problem. Tears began to well in Mrs. Klein's eyes, and she looked at her spidery hands. I've watched you since I took the assignment, he said. You're tough. You don't take shit from anyone. And near as I can tell, you're not afraid of anything. Her shoulders began to shake, causing Shay to kneel beside her. He put an arm around her, and she leaned against him. Rudy killed himself, didn't he? He felt her nod. He killed himself, and Charles couldn't deal with it, either because it was some unforgivable sin, or he felt betrayed, or whatever it is that people go through when someone they love abandons them. She began to cry harder, shaking against him. Charlene, she sobbed. Charlene found someone who knew someone. We both wanted to spare him. He held her tighter and let her cry. After a while, she finally stopped, and Shay released her. Mrs. Klein wiped at her eyes and face, prompting Shay to walk to the bedside table in search of Kleenex. He found some in the second drawer and returned to his chair. Mrs. Klein took the proffered tissue, dabbed at her eyes, then blew her nose. Then she put her hands to her face and turned away from Shay. I must look awful. Before he could comment, she turned back, lowered her hands, and said, What am I thinking? I already look awful. I've got no hair, no breasts. I'm shriveled and wrinkly and weigh about 80 pounds. Shay smiled at her. You look fine. You're a lousy liar. I'm actually a pretty good one. It helps in my line of work. Mrs. Klein nodded. I suppose so. He handed her another tissue and she dabbed at her eyes again. So, you like killing people or what? Shay shrugged. I'm just good at it. Chefs make gourmet meals. Carpenters build things. You kill people. Shay nodded. Mrs. Klein glanced over at the Parker novel. In that book... This hitman tries to kill Spencer, but he survives to capture the guy. Anything like that ever happened to you? Shay shook his head. Always get your man. Or woman, he added. Mrs. Klein smiled. Get many women? Some. So now what? Shay shrugged. I've received my usual half payment, which obligates me to complete the assignment in order to receive the other half. That's how it works? It does for me. So when I'm dead, you get the rest of the money. I'm in no hurry. Mrs. Klein cocked her head. That's supposed to scare me? You're gonna get me some day, and I'll never know when? Shay shook his head. I don't usually get a chance to sit and talk with anyone. I suppose not, Mrs. Klein said. You go out much? The pickings are pretty slim around here. No, I mean just leave for an afternoon. Go shopping, out to a movie, that sort of thing. Maybe when your son comes to visit. Charles lives three hours away. He visits at Christmas, Mother's Day, and on my birthday. I live even farther away, Shay replied. But... If you need an excuse to get out once in a while, I'll come by when I can. Why? Shay shrugged. Because you have maybe six months left to enjoy living. And all you're doing is sitting here watching Louis Spinoza lose at chess. Don't you have a job to do? You hired me. You didn't give me a deadline. I do the job when the time is right. When will it be right? When you decide you've enjoyed living enough. What if I enjoy it? Right up to the end. Shay shrugged, replied, Eh, Charlene will make good on it. I wondered after writing this piece if there was any chance I could sell the idea of a buddy comedy involving a hitman and a senior citizen. Eh, maybe if it was the 80s. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the story, and if you've got a relative stored away in a care home somewhere, 
maybe she or he wouldn't mind a visit. On that cheerful note, I'll close out this episode of the Story By Podcast. As always, thanks for stopping by. I really appreciate it. Story By Podcast is a production of Fiddling Around Productions, LLC, copyright 2018. Theme music is provided by The High Crest, www.thehighcrest.com, and used with permission. This episode included the song Moncoto, incompetech.com, edited by Lewayne L. White, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0 license. Story by Podcast can be found at storybypodcast at gmail.com, www.facebook.com slash storybypodcast, and on Twitter at at Story by Podcast, and of course, wherever you look for podcasts. Story by Podcast is also a member of the Prescribed Films Podcast Network. Check out their other shows at thepfpn.com.